following the death of a member of the Natural State House of Assembly as a result of complications arising from the coronavirus infection. The Natural State Government has imposed a total lockdown on Natural Local Government area of the state. The State Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Abdul Karim Kana, says this is to enable the state government successfully carry out a comprehensive contact tracing exercise. Justice Kana says, however, um, revealed that the lockdown at the Karo local government area of the state has been relaxed and replaced by a dusk to dawn curfew, which commences from 8 p.m. in the night and ends by 6 a.m. in the morning. Total lockdown is hereby imposed on Nasrallah local government area, especially the urban part of Nasrallah local government area. This is to enable the medical team that is presently conducting contact tracing to complete the assignment to ensure that all individuals who in one way or other, either directly or indirectly, have had contact with um, the deceased lawmaker who died on Friday and um, was buried according to Islamic rights, that those individuals who participated either in the burial or interacted with him shortly before his death are located, identified, and their samples taken for the purpose of tests. It is only to emphasize the fact that um, the, the partial lockdown which had been imposed, which is in form of a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. all across the state is still very much enforced. It is also in line with the directives given by the federal government of Nigeria, which has also imposed that taking maybe the cue from what we had had already in the state. So that uh, from the decision of government and the, uh, the meeting today emphasize on it, it has remained and will, people must continue to observe that strictly. We are now joined by Dr. Ifan Ngude to ex ex examine the concerns about second wave of COVID-19. Good morning, Dr. Ngude. Good morning. Now, globally, there have been apprehension about the second wave of COVID-19. Do you share the same concerns? Um, yes, I do. Um, I would say that um, a second wave is probably inevitable. If you look at history, um, similar outbreaks like this, I think um, maybe the best one to compare this with is, is probably the Spanish flu, um, like in a, that, that happened in the early um, 1918 or, or so. And what happened in that case was there, there were multiple um, there were multiple waves. There were at least two waves. Some say three waves. And looking at the, um, the current trends, just globally, um, most of the countries that initially um, were epicenters for the outbreak have gone, they seem to be, have got, they've gotten beyond the hump of the peak and they're coming down. Um, and there are certain things that I think about when I think about the possibility of the second wave. And one of the things I think about is, is as, as countries are easing their lockdown, um, people are probably going to get lulled into a false sense of security and think life can just be the way it was before the outbreak. And so you abandon those habits that you learned during um, the lockdown and you stop doing things like washing your hands, wearing masks, uh, observing social distance. And that could trigger a second wave. And actually, here in the U.S., where I live, um, there's actually already evidence of something like this happening in states like Tennessee and Ohio, where um, a relaxation of lockdown rules or people actually protesting lockdown led to the, the, the curve in those states going from flat to, you know, beginning to go up again. And another thing I think about is, is the virus itself. Um, viruses are notorious for mutating. They mutate especially the kind of virus that this is, it's an RNA virus. And RNA viruses are notorious for mutating. And if you look again at the Spanish flu, the trigger for the second wave of the Spanish flu was a mutation in the original virus. And so it was a completely different strain of the virus that hit the world the second time the wave came. And so um, that's a very real possibility with COVID-19. 
and the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a mutation of the SARS virus from 2003. And there's a very real possibility that there will be another mutation that could lead to a second um, wave globally. And so yes, uh, to answer your question, I am. I do share those, those concerns. Now looking at the situation in Nigeria, do you see any loophole or negligence that could trigger uh, this second wave? So in, in Nigeria's case, you know, I, 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 when I think about Nigeria, uh, my first thought isn't even a second wave. It's that we haven't hit the peak yet in Nigeria. That's my concern. Um, the lockdown has kind of been eased off in Nigeria, but the timing seems a little bit off to me. It was looking at the progression of the outbreak in Nigeria. And you can actually divide the, the progression of outbreaks in general into four phases, at least four phases. There's the linear phase, you know, where cases increase in number gradually day by day. And then there's the exponential phase where the increase is now multiples, is, is multiplied. So it's, it's the cases increase not just day, they don't just increase day by day, but they increase significantly day by day. And so if you look at Nigeria's own case, what happened was, I, I think the first five weeks, we, it took us about five weeks to get to about a thousand cases. Then it, just in the sixth week, the sixth week alone, we doubled that. So we had a thousand cases in the sixth week, in the sixth week, five, five weeks to, to get to the first 1,000 cases. So that suggested to me that we were beginning to enter into an exponential phase of growth. And that exponential phase of growth is then followed by a flattening of, of the curve where the cases are no longer increasing in number day by day, but day by day, they're about the same. Today is the same as tomorrow, is the same as the day after. And then finally, there's a phase where everything begins to go down. So tomorrow's cases are less than today's cases, and, and you know, it keeps going down. And so um, when I look at Nigeria, you asked me about loopholes. That would be the first big one, <laughs> the timing of the easing of the lockdown. But I do understand that economic reasons were behind. I mean, we're, we're very much on the minds of the, of the government when they decided to ease the lockdown. That's one thing. Then another thing that worries me when I think about Nigeria is, is just, I mean, it's, it's the way people have, they seem to have just thrown caution to the wind, right? I, I, so I've seen videos of people at banks not observing social distancing, some not even wearing masks. You know, they've completely thrown away all the habits that, you know, that we learned, I hope, during those four weeks of lockdown in Nigeria. And it almost seems looking at, at, at those videos or uh, reading news reports, you know, it, it almost seems like it's, it's, it, it, it's, we're going to pay for it, if, if you like, in, in a couple of weeks. I do expect to see a spike in the number of cases in, in Nigeria. So for me, when I, when I think about Nigeria, I think, yeah, in terms of loopholes, um, yeah, the people are not, they're simply not observing um, those basic habits that, that uh, we're encouraged to all observe. And even though we do have a very good, very well articulated, I was reading Lagos's, um, um, like the outline, the stepwise, this, these are the things we intend to do as we're easing off the lockdown. I thought it was a very, very well thought out document. And I think Nigeria's own tool was very well thought out. But then implement, implementation has always been a problem in Nigeria. And it looks like about, the implementation uh, will be the biggest bottleneck that we'll face. All right, Dr. Mude, let's quickly look at uh, our testing capacity. I mean, we had a doctor before now, and he was of the opinion that, yes, we could increase. And, and when we do that, the implication is that we're going to get more results. We we'll, we'll hear you know, more people testing positive. Now, what strategy can be quickly deployed to improve our testing capacity so that if we get more results, hopefully more people will be treated you know, or sent to the isolation center and many more people would recover, hopefully, from that? Um, yeah, okay. So currently, I think Nigeria's testing strategy is lab-based, very lab-based. I think there are currently about 18 labs in Nigeria um, with testing capacity you know, across the, the geopolitical regions. But the problem I see with lab-based testing is the logistics of going out to the field, getting um, samples, and bringing them to the lab. I see a lot of delays just, just
just in going out, get the sample, transport it back to the lab and get it tested. Apart from, of course, um, challenges with things like proper reagents and equipment in the labs and all that. But let's just say the labs are well equipped. But just, just the delays that you experience from going to the lab to get the sample and come back, I think those things can really be cut out if we, we employed a strategy that involved point of care testing. I think recently the, the FDA in the US approved uh, some testing kits, mobile, small portable testing kits that um, teams could carry out to the field and, and do tests right on the spot. Kind of like what you would do with the rapid testing kit for malaria, for instance. So I think that that is something that the government should look or, or think about. You know, I think a little bit outside the box. It's not, it's, uh, testing doesn't have to be done in a lab, you know. You can train people, you can deploy teams with mobile testing kits, especially in, in the, the places that we consider the epicenters of, our, of the outbreak in Nigeria, places like Lagos, Kano in particular, the FCT, where you have a lot of cases, and just deploy teams out. You know, and they already have teams going out for contact tracing. Why not train these people on how to use these rapid testing kits? Buy them, give it to them. So they go out, and as they tra test, the, they, they trace contacts, they can test them right there on the spot. I think that this will, will, will help or will go a long way to not only um, increasing the number of tests that we do, but also um, the speed at which we get our test results. Because I think there's a lag. Um, of probably about two to three days between sample collection and actual results. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll have more of a real-time picture if we have um, mobile teams going out like this. This is just one thought that I have. And I think I also like the idea that Open State, I think it was Open State that has this walk-in testing yeah. booths. I think it's Open State. I think right. that's, that's a good one too. Um, so I guess my point here is, is to think beyond lab-based testing. You know, think, think about going out to the field and doing point of care testing as well. Looking at our healthcare system generally, what, what suggestions would you give on, you know, how the public care, uh, public health care rather, can be improved in Nigeria? That's the healthcare system. This is a loaded question. I mean, public health, public health care in general in Nigeria. That's, that's a really loaded question. Um, there are many problems. I, I think one one thing I, I would say is prioritize healthcare. Our health systems are very weak in Nigeria. Um, the health doesn't seem to be uh, much of a priority to the government, right? So I, I can I can say that beyond the tertiary health institutions, you know, the quality of care just just goes down rapidly. By the time you get down to the primary healthcare institutions, there really isn't much going on there. Uh, and a key um, or a part of or a key uh, component of public health is 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 data monitoring, da collecting data, um, analyzing data, looking at where problems are. It helps with policy formulation, tells you where there are outbreaks of disease. You know, it tells you things like like healthcare disparities and things like that. But our system, our data collection system in the country is completely broken. And I think all these things are, are a function of just a lack of prioritization of the healthcare sector in general. I think you just, just start by budgeting properly for health, you know, make sure you budget properly for health, um, fund our health institutions, you know, and and just generally prioritize health. I think that's, that's just the, the because I, I can only answer generally because this is quite a loaded question. And um, we do need to strengthen our health um, systems in Nigeria. But I think it starts with, with budgeting properly, prioritizing health. Um, we don't have a problem, much of a problem with health personnel. Maybe up north, you might say, in the northern part of the country, you might say there is there's a, there's, a, there's a dire need for health personnel. But in the South, I think we're pretty hard. We have a, a good number of qualified medical personnel. The problem isn't so much uh, human resources. It is, it is material resources. It's equipping hospitals. It is providing funds. Um, it is setting up a good data collection system in the country. 
it is you know setting up uh, making sure that that these structures that we already have on ground actually function you know i remember visiting some primary health care centers in the northern part of the country and they were comatose almost like nobody comes to work and then you wonder why we have such weak health systems who is there to respond to um, outbreaks of disease or, or, or health problems at that level, you know, and that's where it all starts. That's, that's the level that is closest to the community. So I would say, yeah, start by budgeting properly and, and prioritizing health in Nigeria. Right. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ifani Mude, and please do stay safe where you are. Thank you.